suicide planes at this critical tactical phase of the war was a psychologically predictable tactic developed by a fanatic enemy. An enemy known for desperate and futile counter assaults. It was easier for the Japanese to decide to use suicide tactics than it would have been for any other people. A glorious flaming death on the deck of an enemy ship was in keeping with Japanese military tradition. From a study of available information, it has been established that there are two different methods of staging suicide attacks. The first is by the organized special attack or kamikaze unit. The second is by a hastily formed suicide attack party made up of any type plane and equipment and ordinary pilots, the latter having been suddenly ordered to crash. In contrast to the rather hit or miss method of the hastily formed attack party, there have developed in both the Japanese Army and Navy Air Forces trained and organized groups of pilots who make up the various units of the Kamikaze Corps. Secrecy and mysticism surround the training of these pilots. In the first stage of their training, emphasis is placed on spiritual intoxication, while later the development of the proper techniques is stressed. The principal differences between suicide plane attacks by the Japanese on a large scale and the conventional airplane attack are as follows. A. The range of enemy attack is greater because no return trip is necessary. B. Percentage of hits is higher because the missile is aimable right up to the point of contact. C. Suicide pilots are more determined and daring and are not deterred by actual or psychological obstacles. D. The suicide plane, with or without a bomb, is an extremely effective incendiary agent because of the gasoline carried. Damage from suicide attacks has been primarily to the ship's top sides, and serious fires have resulted. Even though a ship may not have been sunk when hit by a suicide plane, the consequent operational loss was serious due to the necessity, in many cases, for the ship's return to a Navy yard. Various types of planes have been employed for suicide attacks, but the majority have been single-place, single-engined planes, Zeke's predominating with additional armor in most cases to protect the pilot. Suicide planes may or may not be armed with bombs. Of those armed with a bomb, most have carried 250 kilogram size. Originally, many of the planes crashed without releasing bombs, but recently some planes have released their bombs just before crashing, or on another target. Frequently, bombs have exploded either on crashing or about 20 feet before crashing, without being released from the plane. The Jap rocket-propelled aircraft bomb named Baka, meaning idiot or fool, is 19 feet 10 inches long with a wing spread of 16 feet 5 inches. A bubble-type canopy is provided for the pilot. The propulsion unit in the tail consists of three rocket motors and there are provisions for wing rockets. This weapon is carried on the underside of a bomber's fuselage and is probably launched at the combat cruising speed of the parent aircraft. The final impact speed in a gliding approach with the rocket unit in action should be in excess of 500 miles per hour. Any type of approach may be expected. Steep dives, shallow dives, and low-level runs. The enemy continually varies his type of attack. One recent method has been to approach at low altitude from the bow or astern, parallel to the ship's course, thereby reducing AA fire, and when opposite the ship to execute a wing over and crash into the bridge. Strafing may be expected. In order to effect surprise, a suicide plane may A, approach over land to avoid radar detection, approach at low altitude below the radar horizon, approach in vicinity of or follow friendly planes in order to render identification difficult, use cloud cover, use maximum speed, approach from direction of sun, approach during low visibility, employ simultaneous multiple attacks using one or more planes as decoy. Suicide planes have often attacked isolated, especially pickets, or damaged ships. It is believed that the Japanese suicide planes are being convoyed to a takeoff point by another plane which is radar equipped. The radar interceptor receiver appears to be one sure method of gaining early warning if such tactics are followed. Consideration should be given to jamming any Japanese airborne radar signal intercepted. 
The planes usually approach in a group and split up just before interception by CAP, some creating the diversion and others going into attack. Often the stage is set by accompanying planes which make a faint attack on the opposite side or fly around the ships out of range at about 8,000 feet while the sneak suicide planes come in low or vice versa. Occasionally a bogey has followed the CAP into the formation, resulting in a merged plot and avoidance of discovery. The Japanese have realized that there is a somewhat standard lull between the successive deck load strikes of a carrier raid and have planned to take advantage of this break to make aggressive attacks on our force. Equipment is concealed and held in readiness with the intention of taking off immediately after the air raid terminates. If this tactic is carried out, a TCAP or snooper flight, time to fill the lull between strikes, should be able to destroy previously camouflaged planes and protect the task force from attack. Weather is most important in anticipating the type of suicide attack. The altitude of approach, which has appeared to be determined at random, may be controlled by weather conditions. In clear weather, an approach may be started above 20 to 26,000 feet. Attack from that altitude is begun about 10 miles from the target in a gentle glide to about 5 to 6,500 feet, with the engine throttled to about 17 inches of mercury, apparently to avoid overshooting. If the pilot discovers that he will overshoot, he is instructed to dive steeply to a point slightly short of the target recover to horizontal flight, and then resume his gentle glide. Apparently, the approach is to be as lengthy as possible to ensure accuracy. Medium and low altitude approaches are apparently dictated by cloud formations. If there are scattered clouds, a medium altitude approach may be expected immediately under or between them with no glide preceding the dive. If there is a low cloud cover, the plane will approach just above the water raising to the base of the clouds just before diving. In the low-level attacks, pilots have been reported to come in so low on the water that their prop wash creates a wake and then pull up only enough to clear the deck and crash into the ship's superstructure. Evasive maneuvers of surface craft are relatively ineffective against the low-flying suicider. Evasive action is, however, effective for a small unit against the suicider coming in from high altitude in a steep dive, provided he is damaged and detected soon enough, and the unit can be turned violently in the direction of the attack with rapid acceleration and high speed. The best solution is to shoot the enemy down before he crashes his target. It is therefore most important that formations and dispositions be selected to provide the maximum firepower against the attacker. This will require that the unit be maneuvered to keep the suicider within a bearing 45 degrees either side of the beam of the maximum number of ships. If in a compound formation, consideration should be given to forming on a line of bearing normal to the direction of the expected attack and preferably, when practicable, crews in a circular disposition. All units should exploit firepower, maneuverability, and speed. In the case of high-speed units where conditions permit, rapid acceleration should be made from a speed of at least 20 knots. The determining factor of whether or not to use smoke as a protective measure against suicide attacks, as well as against orthodox enemy air attacks, is whether or not the concealment of ships from enemy planes is sufficient to warrant the reduced efficiency of our AA fire. The following steps should be taken during air attacks to reduce casualties to personnel. Allow only those personnel essential for manning battle stations to remain in exposed positions. Do not allow large numbers of personnel to congregate in one area. Require all personnel to wear a complete uniform with sleeves rolled down and collars buttoned. Cover hands, face, and other exposed parts of the body with flash burn protective cream or protective clothing. Require all personnel to wear helmets. Personnel whose duties permit should lie in a prone position, stomach down. One of the chief dangers from suicide crashes is serious fire resulting therefrom on board ship. Firefighting equipment should be dispersed and some be available for immediate topside use. 
Intensive training of gun crews against this form of attack. Daily drill at early opening of fire, smooth tracking, ammunition supply, recognition, communication, procedure and training in selecting targets according to doctrine while maintaining proper lookouts within the assigned sectors. Develop and employ strict fire discipline to avoid firing into own ships. The tremendous lead angle developed in a deflection shot of a fast moving plane must not be overlooked. Place sufficient fighters between force and enemy to destroy all enemy planes. The CAP high enough and properly stacked to assure contact and altitude advantage. CAP make an early interception in order to remain outside the range of ship's AA batteries and likewise eliminate dot of identification on the approach of any plane. A thorough short range radar search inside a general melee. Maximum emphasis placed on increasing the alertness of our visual lookouts and ensuring prompt transmission of their sighting information to the batteries and bridge. Lookouts must be required to confine their attention to assigned sectors, even during attacks. Avoid sightseeing and distraction. Increasing the alertness of the gun and director crews. Early recognition by all topside personnel. Improve fighter direction. Beware false feeling of security from clear screen, especially low visibility and land areas. Topside personnel on watch properly clothed, others dispersed and below decks. Dispersal of firefighting equipment and availability for topside use. Discipline of friendly planes. Fighter blanket over nearby enemy airfields. Where surprise attack is possible, distribute your heavy AA guns initially to the machine gun directors or in local control if interconnections have not been installed. Radical maneuvers at high speeds consistent with fire control for steep dive attack from high altitude and steady course against the low level attack. In most instances, keep plane within 45 degree either side of beam in order to afford maximum guns to bear and to present a narrow target in range. Unnecessary personnel off topside, dispersed and prone during attack. The extreme necessity for a high volume of accurate five inch fire during the very short period of a single dive attack. Remembering that if the plane gets close enough, his momentum may carry him into ship, although seriously damaged. Do not wait for final solution to study. AA action reports are still being received, stating that the closing plane was tracked for 60 seconds before fire was opened at 7,000 yards. Use 100% VT-fused projectiles and keep shooting. <laughs>